Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters today, Dr. George Perry and Joan Richardson. George Perry brings 40 years of experience in education at the national, state, and local levels. In his role as Director of School Leadership and Organizational Alignment for the New York City Department of Education, George supported the assessment, alignment, and implementation of citywide equity and values-centered leadership development for teacher, school, and district leaders. As the Executive Director of Perry & Associates, George and his colleagues guided over 75 low-performing schools to raise and sustain student achievement by improving instruction, building on strengths and using data and research-based strategies. Joan Richardson is a writer, editor, and researcher with deep expertise around education and rethinking organizational efforts to deepen impact in schools and influence the quality of learning. She was editor-in-chief of Phi Delta Kappa Magazine, the flag flagship publication of PDK International for 10 years, and also the director of PDK Poll of Public's Attitude Toward Public Schools, the nation's, nation's longest running public opinion survey about K-12 educated education. Before joining PDK in 2008, she served as communications director for the National Staff Development Council, now learning forward for 12 years. And now I will hand it off to George and Joan to take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Appreciate it. And good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks for spending time with us to talk about advancing and sustaining equity. Uh, let's jump right in. Uh, Joan? Thank you. <laughs> um, in this webinar, we're going to begin by introducing ourselves in our book, uh, Equity Warriors, say a little bit uh, about that. And then we'll share our thoughts on rebuilding systems and structures to advance equity, particularly in this post-pandemic era. And we'll end by inviting you to join in a community of practice. Uh, so to get started, I want to turn to my colleague, Joan, Schum Joan Richardson, and ask her to say a few words. I think I got such a nice introduction from Melissa. I'm not sure there's anything left to say. I was really honored when George invited me to join him in this project uh, when he was ready to sit down and, uh, and distill all the lessons that he had learned over an amazing career as a school consultant. And uh, I hopped on board and, uh, and I think we put together a book that is uh, both very, very practical and uh, a pretty good thing to read and to follow along and put into practice. So thank you, George. Thank you, Joan. And it's been a, uh, Joan is a remarkable person who is able to to be a real deep uh, thought partner as well as a wonderful uh, editor and, and uh, writer. So I really appreciated the opportunity to partner with her um, and still do. Um, so a few, few things about me and I appreciate Melissa mentioning most of them. Uh, so as she said, the last three years I served in the New York City Department of Education as a director of school leadership and organizational alignment. In that role, we designed and aligned equity-focused leadership development systems across 1,600 schools in 45 districts citywide. This would be a challenging endeavor at any time, and uh, it was made even more so during the pandemic. As you well know, we'll spend a little time talking about the impact of the pandemic on our work. Uh, for 25 years prior to uh, New York City, I led a national consulting group uh, with a mission to partner with districts and schools committed to advancing social justice and equity by strengthening their instructional leadership capacity at all levels, from the classroom to the boardroom. We engage coaching teacher leaders, uh, school administrators, central office leaders, superintendents, school boards to support the achievement of all students, and by all we meant all. We were able to partner with over 30 districts of every size and serving every student population on, on both coasts and almost every place in between. We also partnered over, with over 100 schools whose students have been underserved and some schools that just want to serve students better. Our partner districts made a lot of progress and we learned a lot from their experiences, which brings us to Equity Warriors. Equity Warriors is a compilation of the lessons learned from our districts and school partnerships. It's fundamentally a book of practical strategies, how to define and advance an equity agenda and sustain it over time. 
We begin by accepting that systemic racism and implicit biases exist in our society, and by extension, our public school system. It doesn't have to be so. Equity Warriors offers a lot of examples from our partner schools and districts, 69 moves to be exact, who are advancing equity by building systems and structures. Equity Warriors, or Equity Warriors attempts to answer a fundamental question. If you believe, as I do, that those of us in public education want to make a difference in the lives of children and families, then why are we not getting the results we intend? Our work in partner districts have taught us that the problem is not lack of intention. Almost everyone we've met along the way wants to make a difference in the lives of children. They don't always agree on the how, but most often their spouse's intention is the same. Our failure is called by misalignments between our intentions and our systems. Like when we will launch an initiative, program, or instructional approach and do not provide adequate time to prepare adults or determine levels of readiness. The systems we have are perfectly designed to get the results we're getting. We fail when our systems are not aligned to our purpose. The last two years of the pandemic have uncovered major system failures. While most of our attention has been, on, has been focused on rethinking our organizational systems, like going from almost 100% in-classroom instruction to 100% remote instruction overnight, our systems, our systems designed to advance equity, to support students, adults, and families, to develop leaders, and most importantly, improve teaching and, and learning have been stressed, been shown to be ineffective, or are just plain broken. Everyone, adults, students, inside schools, families and communities are tired and just trying to make it to June. Many have serious concerns about the future. Our systems need rebuilding. And here is the good news. In the next year, we have the opportunity to rebuild our systems, to start over. We know we had resilience to persevere in the face of the global pandemic. We can make our systems work for us if we design them to advance an equity agenda for all of our students, and we commit to our agenda over time. In equity, in equity Warriors, we offer a way forward. Equity Warriors is divided into three parts, student data, values enhanced leadership, and teaching and learning. Within each of these areas, we refer to moves that include research and experience-based strategies, protocols, processes, and other actions that address challenges within existing systems. We ask questions such as, do we use student data in ways to define our equity agenda and effectively tell our story and the successes we have with students each day in every school? Are our values clear, articulated and present in our policies and practices? Do our values guide decision-making? Do our resources, structures, and actions lead to improved demonstrations of student learning? Are they focused on improving classroom practices for all students? And how do you know? These three areas of work, setting an agenda and telling our story, developing leaders, and improving teaching and learning give us the greatest leverage to advance equity, if we are serious. We will share what we need to do to rebuild these structures and systems in a few minutes. I'd like to say a few words about how we rebuild, how is as important as what we rebuild. For those of you in the work, advancing equity often feels overwhelming and complex. We've tried to simplify the complexity by characterizing the moves into three dimensions. Politics, but which we define as balancing conflicts, diplomacy, which we define as the processes to deal with people in sensitive and effective ways by using rewards, consequences, and moral persuasion, and warfare, which we define as pressuring people to stop or start acting in certain ways. Characterizing the moves in this way helps us think about why we make the moves we make and to have a way of talking about alternatives. In other words, sometimes it's important to balance conflicts. Sometimes it's necessary to apply pressure. Naming where we use one approach or another helps us and others understand our actions. 
Our definition of politics emphasizes balancing conflicts, not resolving them. Conflicts are inherent in political systems. The best we can do is balance them in order to be able to move forward. For example, whether you are a district or school leader, balancing conflicts among internal and external partners is ongoing work. It requires engaging, communicating, and being accountable. Diplomacy are those tools that each of you know how to use, those things that grease the wheels, that, that move our systems. When you reward people to join in your agenda or there, there are consequences real or perceived when they're not part of the team, those are transactional tools. But diplomacy also call, includes trans, transformational tools. These tools attempt to convince people to do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. Warfare recognizes that we can't force people to change. They have a choice when they choose not to embrace equity and the equity agenda or act in opposition to it. Our response is to pressure them to change their behaviors. That doesn't mean firing them or evaluating them out, except when their behavior is totally unacceptable. It does mean that we hold up a mirror to challenge their actions, use data to call out actions, make decisions about budgets and positions, choosing the needs of students over the needs of adults. It means, it means having teachers strengthen their needs. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it means, I just got something on my screen, sorry. Okay. Um, it means holding up a mirror to challenge their actions, use data to call out their actions and make decisions about budgets and positions choosing the needs of students over the needs of adults. It means having teachers strengthen their content knowledge, having guidance counselors engage actively with students and be accountable for the support they provide, and having students be accountable for their learning and actions. We know that adults and students tend to avoid conflict, so these moves feel like warfare. However, if we don't act when we face resistance, we lose credibility and our agenda is lost. If advancing equity is important, we need to act consistent with our values. We find thinking about our work in these three dimensions gives us a way to understand the tools we have available to advance equity. And since these three dimensions are the same for district and school leaders, naming them helps us engage each other. So let's talk about the work we need to do to rebuild stru structures and systems. And as we do, we invite you to use the chat to share your thoughts, uh, reactions and questions as we begin to build a community practice. So we offer 10 ways uh, to advance and sustain your equity agenda. As I mentioned, Equity Warriors is divided into three parts, student data, values, enhanced leadership, and teaching and learning. School and district leaders have related but different work to do in each of these areas. In Equity Warriors, we're very specific about the work belongs, about which work belongs to different leaders. But we're also clear that all of this work must go on simultaneously in order to make progress uh, toward achieving an equity agenda. We pull the 10 ways to advance and sustain your equity agenda from these parts. We describe using student data as telling our stories in ways that are authentic, genuine, and personal in order to set the narrative. We include all types of information as part of student data and data, the data comes in multiple formats. The criterion for effectiveness is that data must be compelling to your community and to your audiences. The first system that needs rebuilding are those we use to engage others, develop an equity vision and strategize actions. Well-intentioned equity warriors fall into traps. One trap is misinterpreting the complexity we face and the limitations of our roles. It is understandable that when facing inequalities, inequities, we want to do something about them. We fall into the trap when as leaders at any level, we name the problem and at the same time feel compelled to offer a solution for a quick win. Like we recognize teacher re retention has become an even more even more of a challenge as a result of the pandemic and then announce a simple action step to address the challenge. It doesn't work. 
And we should not pretend there are simple answers to complex challenges. We lose our credibility when we do that. The reality is that addressing systemic racism and impl implicit biases create complex situations. We also know that any action we take is likely to have unintended consequences that might hinder our long-term process or our jobs. We also know that we alone cannot solve complex problems. Effective equity agenda are specific to the context, including the student population, the community expectations, and climate. Engaging others in collecting and analyzing data and defining the equity agenda helps deepen understandings. It starts with bringing, um, uh, bringing people who hold different perspectives and interests together in a guiding coalition to study the cha challenge, consider alternative points of view, propose a vision and a way forward and build constituencies. Successful solutions balance the right amount of aspiration with what is possible in the short term. Long-term success depends on creating buy-in around a vision and strategies. We also need systems and structures to refocus our conversations and a, a agenda on opportunity gaps, not achievement gaps. It is important to measure student growth and know, how, know each of our students well. However, our focus on achievement gaps is a trap that works against advancing equity in two ways, and at least two ways. First, the focus on achievement gaps reinforces misconceptions about groups of students, whether they perform as high achievers or low achievers. By labeling student groups into higher or lower performing groups, we fail to see individual differences, we reinforce biases, and we respond with programs and approaches that generalize to groups and not address the needs of individual students. By categorizing students into groups, we don't see them. The second trap is that a focus on achievement gaps pits student groups in competition with each other, where the only way that one group can advance is at the cost of another. For example, there are those who think the only way to close, achievement gap, uh, to close the achievement gap is to take something away from those at the top or to lessen expectations so that those at the bottom can rise quickly. We see this argument taking place across the country about gifted and talented programs. Competition creates win-lose situations which are especially ineffective in these currently polarized times. The alternative is to focus on closing opportunity gaps, which have been shown to advance equity by determining a need shared by all in providing opportunities for all students. Let's take universal pre-K, for example. In districts that have created universal pre-K, eligibility for all four-year-olds to high quality teaching and learning has been shown to have benefits for all students. By providing universal access to an opportunity that we want for each of our students, we generate universal support for that opportunity. That means that families with different levels of means and access can advocate for all students as they advocate for their own. In doing so, we change the perspective about preschool as a privilege or benefit for one group. By being universal, it becomes a perceived right for all students. We lift the boat for everyone, but most importantly, we can sustain the agenda over time. In addition, uh, we need to build our data collection system in order to conduct deep inquiry into root causes, deep rather than broad. Facing complex, complex and emotionally charged situations, leaders may fall into the trap of misdiagnosing and communicating challenges inaccurately. We operate in political environments in which swift action may be rewarded more than deliberate action. The trap is doing something rather than being clear about what we're doing is the right thing to do. To address systemic biases, it's necessary to use processes that identify root causes and answer hard questions about things like excessive absences, suspensions, placements in alternative and special ed programs, and the other ways of sorting up students. Without deep inquiry, we tend to blame the victims or provide simple solutions to the situations we face. We also take actions that feel like we do to students and families rather than with them. 
Districts and schools use protocols in order to know their students well and use root cause analysis to address system failure. The second area of work we, we identify is values enhanced leadership or leading with purpose. Going forward, going forward, we need to build systems and structures that name and communicate core values. In rolling out an initiative or taking actions, we often fall into the trap of focusing too much attention on the what and how and not enough on the why. When we spend little time on the why, we're often surprised when people question our intentions and our motives, which is a sign that agreement on core values, those values we hold in common are missing. If we are serious about advancing equity, we need to recognize that our district and school is more like a community and less like an organization and act accordingly. Being a community rather than an organization suggests that members are drawn together by shared values and that their membership is voluntary. Purposeful communities name aspirational beliefs, values, and dreams, and the commitments they will make to each other. Effective communities have efficacy. The equity agenda is lost if adults in the community do not believe that their daily efforts matter in the lives of students they serve, and collectively with their colleagues, that their actions matter for all students in their community. It's disheartening to find that some teachers, veterans and new teachers alike, do not believe that they, what they do every day in the classroom makes a difference for students. It is an example of a root cause that is difficult to address, and it takes concerted effort to help each member of the community recognize that they're adding value, especially in times of, of as we've had in the pandemic, in times of conflict. Thinking in disruption, um, thinking of, of districts and schools as communities gives purpose and lets members see they are contributing to a common goal. We need systems and structures to ensure that we communicate our values through policy and action. From parenting to leading, we're all familiar with the phrase, do as I say, not as I do. In a politically and emotionally complex situation, we fall into the trap of defending policies and actions that are not aligned with our espoused uh, uh, equity agenda. We learned through the pandemic that we can't make effective policy by imposing solutions when we face unknown circumstances. Experience fails us. Hindsight does not always lead to foresight. Advancing and sustaining equity is another situation in which we're navigating in unfamiliar territory. Yet communicating a clear set of values can guide us when policy solutions offer little help. When we have shared values, we are able to have confidence in making decisions that are defensible, even when the situations are uncertain and we don't have all the information we wish to have before making a decision. For example, one of our partner superintendents introduced a process for reinforcing shared values through analyzing decisions made by his leadership team. Cabinet meetings were used to discuss how decisions were made. When a decision was made that seemed to violate shared values, he would urge district leaders to correct the decision. And he'd say, that's not who we are. Living our values is a mindset shift. It requires of us courage to name the problem and confidently stand up to our beliefs. Perseverance to stay the course through certain opposition when challenging the status quo and the will to act on our beliefs. Will is different than courage. It is collecting and using political capital to further our aims. By political capital, I mean the assets, allies, resources, and strengths that each of you accumulates over time. Like a savings account that you build to use for a later day. Advancing equity requires us to spend our political capital. For example, we have seen middle school leaders use the trust they've gained with their faculties and families to address the sorting of students by implementing detracking. In our experience, they learn that not only did they have the necessary support to make the change, others wonder why they didn't do, it, do so sooner. So our sixth way, 
Particularly now, we need to have systems and structures in place to develop and support leaders at all levels. Transfer of authority is a trap that many of us fall into. It starts with the question, so what do you suggest? Or what are you gonna to do to solve this problem? Or what do you want me to do? When we respond to these questions with advice or directives, we transfer responsibility for success from the person who asked the question to ourselves. If the idea, program, curriculum, instructional strategy or policy does not work, it's not their fault, it's our fault. We told them what to do. Advancing equity requires each of us to act within our scope of responsibility. It begins by having, having our values and expectations for everyone to be a leader clearly stated in our job descriptions, in our onboarding, in our job assignments, in our, and our reward systems. Providing the tools to sharpen our leadership skills needs to be built into our systems that provide expectations, supports, opportunities to demonstrate skills, and career paths. You know, central office administrators, clerical staff, cafeteria workers, guidance counselors, you get the picture. Everyone is expected to show leadership. Leadership and growth of leaders is everyone's job, not those who have a formal designation. Teaching and learning is the third area of our work. Education leader, um, I think we're behind one. Here we go. Thanks, John. <laughs> teaching and learning is the third area of our work. Um, le education leader Ron Edmonds challenged us by saying, we can, whenever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. He went on to say that we already know more than we, than we need to, to do that. And whether or not we do it must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. When I ask teachers and administrators whether they agree that we know more than we need to know to teach all students, their answer is often that they don't know all they need to know. They're often correct. It takes a long time to learn how to teach every student well. Nevertheless, we know much more than at any time in our history how to educate students. The challenge is that we do not apply our knowledge systematically and consistently. Applying knowledge begins with focusing on our core purpose, to educate every child well. We begin by building systems and structures that treat advancing equity and student achievement as one in the same. I believe that educators, everyone who's part of our education systems, advance, advances equity by building coherence around the gift they are positioned to offer students, which is, which is uh, advancing teaching and learning. To do so, we need to know and educate students one at a time so that they have the tools that will enable them to think, learn, and act independently and apply their knowledge and skills to situations they face now in the future. How did we ever come to the point when helping students to think critically would be legislated as inappropriate? Isn't critical thinking essential to preparing students for success in college and careers? Not doing so has been cited as a failure of our educational systems for decades by business and civic leaders. It makes no sense. We know that being prepared to learn and being ready to learn are not the same. Students come to us with who they are, each one with assets and special gifts that we can learn from. We, need, we know we need to consider the whole child when becoming ready and prepared essentially after the, the pandemic. We have research and examples to, show, to know how to do that. For, for this webinar, I'd like to focus our attention on what we know about helping all children learn. There is nothing in my experience that has led to gains in student achievement as much as building systems and structures around a focus on the instructional core. You're probably familiar with this model. Learning happens in that somewhat magical space where students are engaged and encouraged to bring themselves, uh, their thoughts, opinions, understandings, and gifts into the learning environment. When they have rigorous and appropriate content and learning materials and supports, and a teacher who has content knowledge and instructional skills. The key to understanding whether learning is taking place is the student's performance on the task 
they are given to complete every day. After all, it's their learning that we're after. That is it. We have seen by focusing and analyzing the learning, uh, the learning tasks, we can determine whether developmentally appropriate learning is taking place, whether students see themselves in the learning, and whether or not teachers have skills and support to, to facilitate learning. Applying this model and all that it represents is hard work. But we have the answer to the question and that in general, we know all that we need to know to teach students well. Yet something is missing. Which brings us to step eight. Recognizing the instructional core is a step. The next step is to build coherence and alignment to support the instructional core. Simply put, things get in the way. Competing agenda get in the way. We don't know, we don't keep teaching and learning the main thing. Research has shown that the success of system implementation depends more on coherence and alignment than whether the systems are either tightly constructed or broadly constructed. In other words, educators can do great things when we focus and are consistent. So what do we mean by coherence and how do we build coherence into our systems? Fullen and Quinn defined coherence as a shared understanding about the, purposes, the purpose and nature of the work in the minds and actions individually and especially collectively. In other words, do I know and do all of us know what we're expected to do? How do we build coherence? We focus direction on bringing the pieces together and stop doing things that don't fit by building relationships we, so we can learn with and from each other by having clear expectations about our learning goals and how we get there individually and collectively. And by helping people be accountable to themselves and to others. The underlying message is that success comes once we focus and settle on a direction and we stay the course and broaden our skills sets as we learn. So how do we broaden our skill sets? We build systems and structures that create a culture of inquiry. We often fall into the trap of thinking that creating a culture, particularly a culture of inquiry, is largely a process of coming together and there is a willingness to learn from each other. We might think that all we need to do is just provide a time for adults to come together and talk about their work and good things will happen. Experience has taught us this is not true. Educators at all levels feel threatened when asked questions about what they're doing and their reasoning. Edgar Schein reminds us that an organization's culture, how we do things, is only partially influenced by leader behavior. And that telling people what to do and how to act has minimal impact on culture. Take PLCs, for example. Professional learning communities are a great idea. We've been coaching schools and districts on ways to structure and improve their PLCs for over two decades. However, in my experience, PLCs are rarely successful and sustainable when they're required. Mandating PLCs devalues the professionalism of adults, which in turn limits meaningful learning experiences, especially when members are assigned to communities. PLCs that are successful are ones like the grade level teams that decide to meet after school on Fridays without prompting or supervision to review the past week and to plan for the next. They create their own culture. Shine adds that leaders do have a responsibility to act when the culture is not situated, suited to the situation, like when the culture does not promote equity. He advises us that cultures are formed over time by asking questions, challenging assumptions, and learning together in safe environments. We've had really good experience with bringing people together and asking simple and free questions. Uh, that cut to the chase, are authentic and can form a foundation for people working together. Questions like, what is our definition of rigor? Defining rigor is an authentic task, and the answers are attainable in a short period of time through give and take. Educators know that rigor is relative, so defining rigor requires listening to different points of view. It also leads to further inquiry. Now we know what rigor is, what are we going to do? Finally, last step, uh, we need systems and structures to help us change, excuse, uh, change excuses into opportunities for action. We make a lot of excuses. Most of them are reasonable and have to do with systems or decisions we feel are out of our control or because we operate with humans in a political environment that is dynamic. 
For the last two years, most of us were feeling overwhelmed and we've had to deal with serious personal situations and loss. Going forward, building systems that bring us together off the best, offer us the best hope of advancing equity. For example, we partnered with an historically underserved school district with historically underserved students who were highly mobile. The superintendent decided to mandate the teaching of units of study in English language arts and mathematics at every grade, grade across the district so the students could receive, would receive consistent instruction. And the students who moved from school to school would find teaching that was familiar. Students would complete tasks at the end of each unit to demonstrate their learning. Well, there was pushback across the district. Um, but over a few, year, few years, everyone began to see measurable progress. Also, teachers noticed that incoming students were better prepared by some of their prior year peers, prior year teachers than others. They, the, they learned the lesson that if everyone did their part, then they would need, not need to work as hard to see measurable progress. They began to pressure one another. Working together could do more than working independently. And so it did, and it began to change the culture. Which brings us back to the beginning. We have a lot of examples of progress made in advancing and sustaining equity uh, through hard work that has had ups and downs. Coming out of the pandemic, we must seize the opportunity to rebuild and redesign systems and structures in order to recapture lost ground and to guide the success of each and every student. We need them more now than ever. Each of us has something to offer and it's up to us to structure ways that we can contribute to the learning of all of us. We urge you to create communities of practice in your districts and schools so that you can wrestle with the challenges of truly advancing and sustaining equity with others who are on similar journeys. We also invite you to join us in conversation by sharing your experiences and questions uh, with us at www.equity-warriors.com. We hope to create a network for ideas and experience sharing. We'll not post or share any ideas or questions without permission. We'd like ultimately to create a virtual space for learning because all of us are smarter than any one of us. We're also soliciting your suggestions about how to make the space helpful to you. So thank you for your time and attention. I see we've got uh, 15 minutes or so to uh, respond to questions and comments in the chat. I see that there have been things coming up. so. Um, uh, I'm happy to, re to respond to them. Um, Joan, Melissa, what, do you, what would you like to suggest? Well, I'm wondering if you could start, there were a few comments um, asking about the choice of the word warfare. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So we chose, you know, we chose equity warriors um, as a way to demonstrate um, the importance and also the um, directness of the work that needs to be done. Um, and um, uh, we wanted to uh, point out in terms of various dimensions that um, doing things like dealing with resolving, balancing conflicts uh, through uh, politics or using diplomacy in those moves that we make, we do those things regularly. Um, but there's also a dimension of being able to take action in the face of, um, of uh, opposition or resistance or just no, seeing no progress. And unless we really move and uh, take those actions, we, uh, we, lose, uh, we lose our agenda. People don't take it seriously uh, and don't take us seriously. So in thinking about how to frame that, we thought about using, we, we selected the, we know that warfare is applying pressure to situations. Um, and uh, we don't mean it in the way that uh, we want people, as some, some leaders approach it, which is to go in and attack a school or turn everything around by firing people and moving people away. But the whole notion of challenging people around their thinking 
and putting pressure on them to be self-reflective. Uh, folks in school systems, students, teachers, administrators, all people in the central office, from our experience, and tell you that raising tough questions feels very, makes people very, very uncomfortable. And to be able to, to do that and do the hard work we want to be able to do, we want to recognize that that is, uh, does make people feel very uncomfortable. And it is, very, in some cases, feeling very extreme. But we've got to get past that if we're going to move our equity agenda. We have to really be um, uh, both setting the conditions for readiness and preparation for those conversations, but also not shying away from it. So the dimension of warfare is both a, a warning um, and is uh, 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 a call to be able to address this. You know, it's really unfortunate that, you know, we, we certainly published this book well before the situation in the Ukraine, which has our constant daily attention. But I'll just make a parallel. I mean, the destruction there is uh, something that is so disturbing that um, it reminds us that when we go into a situation and disrupt it so much that we have nothing left from their work. And leaders sometimes will do that in schools and try to, uh, uh, particularly schools that have been underserving students and do very radical moves to be able to to um, uh, change the situation. And that's very, very much unfortunate. So in our in our, our discussions around in the book, we try to call both of those things out, being very, very sure about what you're doing, when you're doing it, and putting some parameters around. Um, and uh, hopefully not thinking about sort of the extreme pieces to that, uh, that we seem to be unfortunately, and for, for the people in, in Eastern Europe, uh, having to deal with at this point. If I can add something to that, I think sure. one of the things that I, uh, I really like about the way George thinks about all of this is that he presents this not as an ultimatum, but as a process. So there's really a continuum of how you lead equity work in a district and you, you can begin it at the place that's most comfortable for you, that's most appropriate for your community, while also recognizing that when, you know, when the rubber hits the road, sometimes you do have to, and when politics doesn't work, when diplomacy doesn't work, you can't be afraid, uh, you can't shy away from the hard work that has to be done, but that there are other possibilities, there are other steps that you can take first before you reach that point. And I think that's a, that's a lesson that a lot of people don't spend much time thinking about is how you progress through that continuum and recognize that uh, what works, where you may be able to begin in one district is not where, you know, not may not be what will work in another district or in another school. So another question that came up in the chat was, um, people talking about collective efficacy and the developing leaders at all levels. And somebody specifically raises a question about the role of students in this. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk, you do talk about that in the book. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that with this audience. Great, uh, thanks for the, for the question. Um, you know, I'm not, well, I'm not sure where it begins, but um, probably you have been in the same, many of you have been in the same situations that I've been in, uh, where we observe students and teachers negotiating uh, the level of rigor in the classrooms. Um, and that uh, never, end, never ends well, I think. Um, uh, so, you know, students certainly, we, when we talk about no excuses, we mean that for students as well. We want, on the one hand, students to take responsibility and be engaged in their learning. And we need to show them how to do that. 
but we need to show them how to do that in an early age and have authentic ways and realistic ways for them to be able to engage that and carry it through. And then we need to hold them accountable for being able to demonstrate that. And so um, there are multiple ways in which um, students need, we can, we can have students uh, demonstrate their leadership and demonstrate their engagement. But I would say that if we want the instructional, the most important way to do it is if we look at the instructional, the diagram of the instructional core, students need to also be invited and to be expected to show up into those, to the, uh, to instruction every day. And they do that, one of the ways that we do that effectively is by giving them uh, tasks that are challenging and uh, and supporting them and being able to do those tasks. And then we learn when they do those things um, and they respond to those, those, those tasks that uh, learning is taking place and it builds on itself. Um, so it is a whole progression of things, both from seeing students to recognizing students, but ultimately also to hold them accountable. And I think from and helping them be prepared and ready to take leadership, um, but most of my experiences, I think when we make, I've seen the when we make space and opportunity for them to do that, they take they they stand up and take the responsibility, um, uh, and it's a lot of work. It is a lot, all of this is a lot of work, um, and as Joan pointed out, the way that we structured the book is to give lots of options based on the context of where you want to start, uh, which move makes the most sense for you. And that should come from school and district teams talking together about where do we begin? Let's do a real honest appraisal of where this is and where do we start and, and um, how do which of these moves make sense for us. And certainly ones in throughout the book are examples of students taking uh, how we work with students and taking responsibility from the individual daily uh, lesson to the way that we involve them in setting the equity agenda to the day that we uh, to the, the ways that we engage them as leaders of, of uh, both their peers and, and with adults in partnership with adults. Uh, somebody else raised, speaking of the language that's used in the book, somebody else is asking a question about using the word agenda um, and wondering if that's a more common New York City term than in other parts of the country. So I thought I'd just throw that into your lap and see what you want to say about that. <laughs> no, actually, you know, I've spent my uh, most of my life outside of New York City and I, I don't, I only live there, I worked there for three years. Um, most of my time has been uh, all over the country. So um, uh, fortunately have had uh, for a long period of time flying every week to someplace. So, um, but thanks uh, but thanks for the question. Uh, one of the ways that, uh, because this, the way that we approach this is that um, the, each community, each, each school district and community needs to determine what they mean by equity. And so we, when we were writing uh, this, we tried to use equity agenda as being generic rather than saying you need an equity mission statement or you need this equity mission statement or you need that equity mission statement. You really need to go through the process to determine what it is that you mean in your community by advancing equity. And however you frame that, uh, um, we just call it an equity agenda, but uh, it's really advancing equity by using how you define that. And every district, every district, we've worked with, we've worked with high schools where 90% of the students were, were uh, uh, proficient in state assessments, and they worked at the 10% that weren't. I mean, everybody has work to do. Um, so how do you define that work? And, you know, in that school in particular, what they found from working on the 10 percent had lessons learned for the other 90 percent. They got better at the, uh, the whole school by focusing on the students that um, there was were struggling. So everybody has work to get to do. However, you frame that is 
we're using language that is comfortable to you and appropriate to your to your context. Um, um, but it's worth it, and in, in particularly your student and family population, which uh, uh, so we'll stop there. I'll just throw in something else on that. And when you think about um, asking the community what equity means to them, to be absolutely certain that you're also including students in that conversation. Um, I saw an example of this in my own community recently where we had a panel discussion talking about how American history was being taught. And we had um, some really good adult experts talking about the textbooks and the topics and everything, but hands down the most influential voice we heard from there was from a high school student who talked about uh, how those lessons really landed on uh, students of color in classrooms and what they really wanted to see taught. And it was a riveting moment because we don't, we often don't let students stand up and speak on those important issues. And when they do, they are, they are very, very powerful voices and they need to be at the table much more often than they are. Mm -hmm. And I think we've come to the end of the questions. Is there anything, George, you didn't get asked that you wanted to be asked by? You know, I, I want, I, just one thing I wanted to say and to look at some of the comments that you made, I really appreciate it. We would really sincerely wish that you would, uh, you and others would engage, begin engaging with us and tell, sharing your stories with us uh, of what you're doing and how you're doing. Um, you know, in preparing for today uh, and sharing these, what I think are, are lessons that we can draw from our work, um, I don't want them to make them sound like they're universally applied to everyone, right? There is good stuff, I believe, and I have seen because I've seen it, and I've seen it everywhere, that there is good things happening for students every day in every school. How we need to start to tell those stories, how we need to build um, uh, relationships and networks of people to take back the narrative about our schools and be able to talk about them in ways that your families and communities appreciate. Uh, this part of my my belief is that our, our and as I mentioned, achievement looking at achievement gaps sets the wrong approach for us. We lose in that. We need to be talking about what it is that we're doing every day for students and um, and making and have our communities build our communities around that. And we do that by building communities with each other. And it has been so hard over the last two years to build and sustain communities, let alone advance equity and sustain equity. Um, the progress we've made in years before, prior to that, which still a lot of work to do, but we were making progress. It's still hard. Uh, we lost some ground. So we need to be able to uh, think about in all of this, these are not absolutes, these are not universals. These are things to be paying attention to and using for using as a criteria for your own, look at your own system and districts and schools and say, where, do, where are we, where are our strengths and where do we go from here? And I appreciate the work that you do every day uh, for students and families throughout the country in, in your schools and communities. So thank you for the opportunity to listen a little bit. Thank you both so much. That's a great call to action to end on, George. And I hope that people do visit the website and take you up on that opportunity to share some of their stories. So thank you, everyone, and have a great week.